Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing this evening? It is currently 1.06 a.m. on this wet, damp, muggy, 68 degree <laughs> Saturday evening going into Sunday. I just got off the phone with my good Judy Mel, partner in crime to a true crime book club. It was her birthday today. So I was calling her to uh, see how her birthday went. She had a great day. She and her husband went shopping. She got candles at Bath and Body Works. She got ghoul friend, mahogany teakwood, and I can't remember the third one. <laughs> I think maybe she couldn't remember the third one. And then she also went to Joanne Fabrics and she got yarn, a bunch of new yarn, because you know she crochets and knits. And then they got Panda Express and she had red velvet cake. And she was relaxing and crocheting when I called and talked to her. Because you know it's three hours earlier and um, Arizona and we talked for about 40 minutes on the phone, it was fun. We were talking about true crime and all kinds of stuff. And birthdays and crochet and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, today was a great day. My stomach hurts a little bit right now because we got pizza tonight. Um, I'm drinking water. And I also have a Diet Coke right here that I have not opened yet. We went over to Sarah's tonight, Alex's best friend Sarah, to watch a movie and to have pizza. We got hot box pizza. And I had two breadsticks and three small, well, two bigger pieces and like a smaller piece. And like, I was like, I am so full of my stomach. I, and I hadn't eaten anything else that day. Well, I had some chips and salsa, or not chips and hummus earlier. But like my stomach, I just it started hurting from this pizza. The pizza really wasn't that great either. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't as good as hot box usually is. I usually love hot box pizza. But I did post a picture of my pizza on my Instagram story and hot box pizza reshared it on their story, which was very exciting for Peter tonight. <laughs> so it was fun. I love going over to Sarah's house. Sarah's house is so homey. And she's done such a nice job of like making it really nice. And she's like white brick walls and she lives real close to us. And um, like she lives more like in the neighborhood where my aunt and uncle lived when I was growing up. And she's a cute house. It's like all one story and it's just wood floors and brick walls. It's just really cute. White brick fireplace. And um, so we watched the movie Old because she's been wanting to see it for a while. So we watched Old, which is that M. Night Shyamalan, I can't even pronounce his last name, movie. And um, I really have liked a lot of his movies in the past, like The Sixth Sense. There's always one that I forget that I like of his that I can't remember what it was. But he did The Sixth Sense, he did The Village. I really like The Village. Um, the Lady in the Water. He does a lot of movies where you don't really know what's going on. You know, and this one I would say is definitely similar to that. It's about, I don't want to give too much away because I know a lot of people want to see it, but it's about uh, this couple and their two kids that go to this island resort. It kind of started off and reminded me a lot of like that White Lotus Hotel, the, the, the Lotus Hotel or whatever that show was called. It kind of reminded me of that. They go to this hotel and then something weird happens. But, uh, but you don't really know why. It's filmed so strange, strangely though, that like, like if something is happening, like somebody's getting stabbed, you don't see the person getting stabbed. You see like the camera is on the people watching it. Like, so it's, you never really see what the actions that are happening, which is really interesting. Alex and Sarah did not like it. They thought it was bad, in fact, they were like, once we got home, Alex and Sarah were texting back and forth about what a crap movie it was and add another horrible movie to the SHI Took movie list and all this kind of stuff. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I mean, because it was something different than usual, which I like that, you know? 
But um, this water tastes so good. We just sat around and talked and stuff and hung out with her and her dog and it was fun. She had a Zoom call with her and her whole family because it was her nephew's birthday and he was unwrapping presents and so like the whole family was like, and Alex knows her whole family so he was saying hi to everybody and stuff and then they were watching her nephew unwrap presents. So that was first, and then we watched the movie and had pizza and stuff. It was fun. We had a really good time. And, um, yeah. I got them gummy bears and mambos. They wanted now and laters, but they didn't have them at the gas station. And I got M&Ms for me. And some other stuff. It just was fun. We had a nice, relaxing night. It was funny because... Like the hour before, I was still like uploading videos, and Alex was like so tired. He had a baby shower that he went to today for his friend that we're going to the couple shower. I think it's next weekend. Um, but today was just like he said it was mostly like people that she grew up with, like family friends. And so he went to that baby shower, and it was from two to five. And he came home, and he was so tired. And he like fed the dogs, and he's like, "I'm gonna go upstairs and lay down." And so I came upstairs when I got everything done at like 7.25 and I set my alarm for like 7.45 and 7.50 because we had to leave at like 5 till 8 and I was just going to throw in some clothes and leave and so um, I I used to call those disco naps back in the day I fell asleep so hard you guys in 20 minutes I don't even know how yeah, I was out for the count and um, Alex and I were both like, I mean, he was so comfy in bed and the dogs were being so cuddly and the fan felt so great. So Alex was like, oh my God, I'm so tired. And I said, I know I could sleep another four hours. He said, I could, he goes, I could sleep straight through the night. He goes, I don't know why I'm so tired. I think it's just like fall weather. Like the weather starts changing and you know, last night when I got done vlogging, I, um, I finished the first book in the Aurora Tea Garden um, series by Charlene Harris. It was really good. But it wasn't like great. But then I kind of like, after I finished it, like when I got into the second book, like I gave it three stars. I think I went back and changed it and gave it four stars. Or maybe I just decided I was gonna give the next one four stars, I can't remember. But like when I, finished it I was like yeah it was just okay but then when I started I immediately started listening to the second one and it was like really good and I'm like I think now that I know the characters like I'm really into the series and I really like it now and the books are super short there's only 10 books in a series the second one is called Bone to Pick and um like something really good happens like right out of the gate and it's really like makes it very interesting right away as well um so yeah so I'm listening to that and then I also listened to half of an episode of your own backyard podcast I need to finish that and because I've been listening to that for a while and I'm on like episode six I think or seven It's interesting because the whole podcast is really about like one person that he suspects did this crime. At least what I've been listening to so far. Like the majority of the podcast is like, it's got to be this one guy, this Paul person. Um, and I do know that like the podcast came out in like 2019 and then he added two episodes, I think this summer because more came out about the case. I think maybe they convicted somebody or something came out about the case this summer. So he did like two follow-up episodes, which are on there. Cause I think there's like 10 episodes and then there's like 11 and 12 that came out after that. I'm not really sure what I'm going to listen to next. I think I might listen to either Serial or, cause a lot of people have recommended that to me, or I might listen to, um, I think it's called A Murder in Illinois. Small, a murder in a small town, Illinois, or something like that. I've heard good things about that, too. So. Yeah, I don't know. It 
it's interesting how many people I talk to that listen to true crime podcasts and like I told all of them that I listened to that Tom Brown's body and that it was so fantastically done and like very few people have heard of it like when I tell them they're like I've never heard of that before I found it on a list of like the best true crime podcasts of 2021 it's kind of warm in here I don't know why I have the heat on. So then I got up today and just kind of screwed around and didn't do a bunch around the house. I didn't do a bunch of stuff, just some stuff around the house. Um, I am loving sitting on my front porch with my mom and just sitting out there. But it was raining most of earlier today, so it was just like wet and gross outside in Indiana um, or Indianapolis. Like, I love the rain, like if you're not going anywhere, but to just like, when it's kind of warm and then it's just, everything is wet and damp, I don't love that. So, when Alex left for the pot, or I said podcast, when Alex, when Alex left for the podcast, when Alex left for the baby shower, I um, had like this plan of all these videos that I was gonna film, and I kept on having all these problems filming them. And so, like, I had to do, well, I filmed over the, I did a review video of this dog advent calendar that's real cute that I got at Costco. And then I started filming a drama video and I filmed, like, I just, like, deleted it and filmed over it. I didn't even, like, realize what I had done until, like, I had started. I was just like, oh my god. I, so I had to do the whole review video all over again. And, um, yeah, and then, so, and then filmed a drama video, filmed a Peterisms video, and got those videos up, got the vlog up, and, uh, I don't know I, what I'm going to do tomorrow. I may, I haven't decided yet. I'm feeling like maybe I'll make like a review video and like a Peterisms video and then unless there's some like major drama that pops off or something I may just take the day off from doing a drama video tomorrow and I may I do have uh, my September booktube wrap up but I might do that on Monday and then um, I have some Peter Does Stuff videos that I want to make but I may save those for Monday so, depending on how I'm feeling after brunch tomorrow, I may do a review video. I have this table that I was sent. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy. It's like a desk table that I was sent. Um, and so, I've been, it's been sitting literally like on our two chairs on, it's like this huge box. And it's been sitting on our, like by our dining room table. And like every day, Alex is like, are you gonna do that review? Are you gonna do that review? So I know nobody's gonna watch this video when I open it, but um, I'm excited to see what the table looks like. So I may do that video tomorrow. Um, and then a Peterisms video, and then just have those two in the vlog up. Or I may make videos on all of my channels, or I may just not make any videos tomorrow. I don't know, we'll see. See how I feel tomorrow when I get up. We'll probably go to brunch tomorrow. Um, Alex and I drove home tonight from Sarah's, and then, cause she was getting tired. Ooh, I'm getting tired, but I'm gonna get my second one here in a second. I looked over there, and it was, um, what do you call it? A shopping cart, but it was like stuffed with bags. And I thought that there was like a person sitting in it or sitting there. What's in there? That's so weird. Anyway, um, Alex was so tired when we got home. He took the dogs out real quick and he was playing his video on the front porch, just sitting there while the dogs were doing their business. <laughs> doing their business. Mind your business. <laughs> and then, um, he came inside right as I was leaving to go vlog. And he was getting ready to go to bed. He was so exhausted. We were sitting there on the couch. We were sitting on the couch tonight talking, and I just like looked at my husband. I was like, my husband is so good looking. I love him so much. I 
all these mums at places being sold that like haven't even sprouted yet. I mean, I guess it still is kind of early in the fall, but when you can buy mums for the same price, why would you not buy mums that are already fall? It was interesting because I did this video on my Peter Does Stuff channel um, showing my front porch and I thought that the prices of the pumpkins that I got, I mean the pumpkins are in really good shape and they're huge. I mean I don't know that you can see it on camera but they're like literally like this big. And a couple of people were like, I can't believe you paid that much for those pumpkins. I got a pumpkin for a dollar. And I'm like, where did you get a pumpkin for a dollar? I can't even remember where I was. I think it was Costco or, I don't remember where I was, but I showed it on a video. And even there, and it was like some discount place. The pumpkins were $5. And they, it was Costco, yeah, it was Costco. And they weren't even like the greatest pumpkins in the entire world. So I'm like, where are people getting like really great pumpkins for a dollar? Like I've never heard that before. Um, in Indianapolis, pumpkins can be kind of pricey. And especially like the closer you get to Halloween, they like seem to get more expensive. Even like little, little pumpkins, I aren't a dollar anywhere that I've been. And that farmer's market, like I think that the prices there, for some things are high, but for some things are pretty, they're pretty fair, honestly. He was telling me, I said to him, that restaurant, I think, is this Jamaican restaurant that all these people tell me to go to. They say it's so good. Um, he was telling me that they get all of their mums from, like, a place on the south side, a farm or something. I don't know. On the south side, because they have, like, the best mums in Indianapolis. He said something. I said something to him. He goes, yeah, we're open from... April to November. And I said, well, yeah, I come here in the summer and buy stuff from each other. They were really nice. He's like, yep, we're here all the time. Open April through uh, November. I don't know why they don't do trees, Christmas trees, and have Christmas trees out there, too. People don't really buy real Christmas trees as much anymore, do they? Have you ever done the thing where you go to like a tr Christmas tree farm and you pick your tree and you like ax it down? I've never done that. I know that there's a whole list of complications that come along with having a real tree. Um, I mean, I've heard of everything from people being like, it's a fire hazard to they die easily to all this kind of stuff. But like, I feel like Caroline a couple times has had a real tree. Um, and I don't know necessarily how I feel about axing down a tree. Like, I don't know that I feel really, you know, I, I try to do some things at least that are good for the environment. I don't know how I feel about that. But I do know that those trees are like, you know, on a Christmas tree farm are farmed for that specific purpose. I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but has anybody done that? Like, I mean, in the dead of winter when it's like snow outside and it's snowing and you have hot chocolate and you and your family go and pick your tree out. I think that would be kind of Christmassy romantic, you know, it'd be kind of fun. I feel like I've known a couple people that have done that. I just don't know where they go around here to do it. But, like, we don't put up a big Christmas tree anymore anyway, so. It's weird to even think about Christmas, and here it is. It's going to be Christmas before we know it. I was just telling Mel that after I get done with this uh, Aurora Tea Garden book... Unless I should, for some reason, finish it tonight. If I finish it tonight, I've got like two hours left, I think. If I finish it tonight, then I will start another cozy or another mystery. And then after I finish that, I will start the House of Gucci book. But if um, if not, and I finish it tomorrow or the next day, my the next book that I'm going to read is The House of Gucci. And then I'm going to read, which Mel said it was completely different than what she thought it was going to be. 
And I was like, well, do you think I'm going to like it? And she's like, well, if you love fashion. She's like, if you're interested in fashion, or she, I don't know if she said that, but she's like, if you're interested in fashion and the history of fashion, then sure, I think it'll be interesting to you. She was like, and it starts off talking a lot about the family stuff. She said, but it's definitely not what I thought it was going to be. So I don't know. We'll see what it's like. Um, I know I may, I need to make a dedicated effort to listen to some of that book this week because, uh, <laughs> well, next Sunday is our book club and I haven't even started it yet. So, um, but I have all kinds of mysteries, cozies and not cozies that are shorter that I want to start. There's one that I, Stowaway. I thought it was called Shipwreck the other day. It's called Stowaway and it just came out. And I don't know if it's getting good reviews or not. The cover of it kind of looks like a James Patterson novel, but it's not. But it looks good. And um, I kind of want to listen to that book. But like, here's the thing. Like, once I get into listening to cozies, I just want to listen to cozy mysteries. Like, that's all I want to listen to. They're just so endearing, and, like, I'm so into the characters of it. And, like, I really want to go back to the Flipped for Murder one. Um, like, th that's the other thing. It's, like, with the, uh, what's it called? Secrets in, uh, Secrets in Scrabble, the one that I just read by Josh Lehman about the, the gay cozy mystery. Like, I listened to f those first four back-to-back and really enjoyed the characters. I was so into the characters that it was just like, one would end, the next one would start. One would end, the next one would start. Now, I will tell you with the Aurora Tea Garden book, one, the first one ended and the next one started like six months or a year later, which I thought was kind of weird. They usually kind of pick up right around the same time that they, they, the last one stopped, or maybe a few weeks later or something like that. Um, but I want to go back to that Flip for Murder one and I want to read that. And... Um, I want to finish the Dexter series because I want to watch the TV show too, but I want to finish all the books first. And um, and I also know that that's coming back. Like they're rebooting that show, I think. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll read all cozies this month other than Peter's Book Club, which I'm excited about those two books. And then I have The House of Gucci and I have the Behind the Horror. I'm excited about reading the Behind the Horror book too because I got it in the mail and the pictures inside are very interesting. So I think that will be an interesting book to read. I don't know. We'll find out. I've always loved to read books and watch movies that take place around certain holidays. So like at Christmas time, I love to read Christmas books. You know, where did I put my lip on? Here it is. At Christmas time, I love to read Christmas books and watch Christmas movies and Christmas TV shows and cartoons and listen to Christmas music. I just feel like let's make the most of the season, right? With Halloween, it's the same thing for me. And uh, on that Cozy Mystery website, which is like Cozy mystery.com you can look up all of the Halloween cozy mysteries she's got them all listed in a row but it's also got other books on there that aren't cozies like uh, Agatha Christie Hercule Poirot I can't pronounce his name Hercule Poirot he's like a book of I think it's called Halloween Party I read that actually I read that actually last year um, and some other books are listed on there as well The Halloween Tree by Ray Bradbury which is definitely not a cozy mystery um I actually own the VCR copy of that animated film to a Halloween tree, which is kind of bizarre. <laughs> so I need to figure out what books I'm gonna read for Halloween and what movies I'm gonna watch and shows and stuff. Now, I have to tell you, I have watched Halloween movies so far, well, a scary movie every day this year on, of October. I, yesterday I watched Hocus Pocus, today we watched Old. Um, I feel like I watched something else too. What was I watching today while well, I was, was that yesterday that I was uploading videos? No. So, Hocus Pocus, old, and then tomorrow I'll put on something to have it on. I just like to have stuff on in the background, too. 
I was watching that, Halloween H2O. I think the beginning of that movie is one of the, my favorite beginnings of any Halloween movie. It's like when that nurse comes home and she has the two neighbor kids come over with their hockey sticks and make sure that there's nobody in her house and then Michael Myers is over there and he kills all of them. Like, that's like one of my favorite openings and like the way that they go back and they explain who Dr. Loomis was and, um, cause like he died, like, the guy that played Dr. Loomis died before they filmed that movie, I think. I think that's why he's not in that movie. So, they go, yeah. And so they, he died, like, in the filming of the, the one before that. And so they go back and explain who Dr. Loomis was and all this kind of stuff. I just love the beginning of that movie so much. And the music is so scary. And... are so great. I actually like 4, 5, and 6 a lot. Which I know is, like, crazy. Like, I like the first one. It's definitely probably my... I don't know that it's my favorite. I think, like, the one where um Jamie is the foster daughter and the older sister says to her, she goes, like a real sister? And she goes, but we're not real sisters, Jamie, that one. And then she takes her, like, trick-or-treating, and they go to the house, and they're all in that house together. And the one girl, uh, like, that is dating her boyfriend is, her dad's the cop. Like, I really like that one. I think that's four. And then five, I like two. That's when the girl has the baby, and Michael Myers wants the baby because it's like, I think a descendant of him or something like that. And is that five? I don't know. And then H2O, I like that one. The, the one I was talking about before is like, it gets real weird though. And it's about uh, Tommy Doyle has like a radio show. You guys know what I'm talking about, that that one? I like that one. Tommy Doyle has a radio show and he's like, and then it's like all those people go to the Halloween party on like the college campus. I think that's five. Well, five is where Jamie is in the hospital and she won't talk anymore. So I think that's five, I'm not sure. And then I don't, I think H2O is six. And then I think seven is the one with Busta Rhymes. And I have to be honest, like, I love Rob Zombie as a horror movie director, but I'm not a huge fan of the Rob Zombie Halloweens. Like, I don't think they're horribly done, and I love his wife and anything. Oh my God, she is so fantastic in The House of a Thousand Corpses, and I love her, love her in The Devil's Rejects, and I love her in, um, Oh, shoot. 31, and I love her in the third movie, The Devil's Rejects. I can't remember what it's called. Just three or something like it's House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, and then the third one. I can't remember what it's called. But she's so good. Um, but I'm not a huge lover of... And she's in the Halloween movies, too, I think. She plays Michael Myers' mother. And I, I believe. I'm not a huge fan of that installment. But I think he did a great job, and I think it's very, very scary. Um, and I think it explains a lot. I'm just not really into that. I'm, I'm more of the Mustafa Akkad franchise. Like, that's what I love. Um, the original series and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not a big lover of Halloween 3, but I also haven't seen it in a really long time. Melissa really likes Halloween 3. I need to go in and watch it. In fact, she's been buying collectibles and stuff for Halloween 3 lately. Um, because she really likes that movie a lot. I feel like I need to go in and watch Halloween 3 again. That's one of the ones where it's like... Five more days till Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. And they put the masks on and then the masks shrink to their head. I feel like I need to go in and watch that one again. Yeah, but Melissa really likes that one. 
and it stopped. But she's like, you need to watch uh, Halloween 3, you need to watch it. I'm like, I probably do need to watch it again. And you know the other thing is, whenever I look up like the scariest movies of all time, horror movies, uh, John Carpenter who did, he didn't do Halloween, did he? No, that was Mustafa, did he? John Carpenter did Halloween, yeah. I'm like losing my mind. He like did, did John Carpenter do the, he did Halloween. The Thing is supposedly like the scariest movie of all time. And um, I'm like, these people are going super, 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 super slow. Um, and he did the movie The Thing. And I, if I've seen The Thing, it's been a long time ago. But like the remake of The Thing, the one with, uh, I can't think of the guy, but it takes place and they're like in like Antarctica or something like that. Apparently that movie is supposed to be really, really scary. But people think that Alien with Sigourney Weaver is really scary too. And when I was a kid, I thought that movie was really scary as well. But I don't think it's super scary anymore. I don't think any of those Alien movies are that scary, honestly. But I guess it depends on each person, you know, what you think is scary and what you don't. I don't know. Put it in the comment section below what you think is the scariest movie of all time. Eight more days till Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. This is an Uber in front of me. I think it's an Uber and a Lyft and they're like side by side. Magic Shamrock. I think that's what they say. Is that what they say? Something like that? I mean, honestly, I think Jaws is one of the scariest movies ever. Of all time. But, you know, because that's because I'm so afraid of sharks. I like to look at the Halloween decorations that people have up. And I have to say that this year, people are really going in on, like, the haystalks. And to Sarah was talking about this plant that she has in her house, like this huge plant. And she was like, do you want this haystock? And I was like, no. I mean, it's this huge plant she has, right? But anyway, people have like already got like their pumpkins. I thought I was kind of early, but people already have like their pumpkins out and their haystalks and stuff like that. I remember my mom when I was growing up, she used to get two big, huge mums. Somebody asked me about this in my video the other day. She used to get two big, huge things of mums and put one on either side with this brick courtyard, this huge brick courtyard. And then it was like uh, two steps up, all brick, red brick. And our house was white brick and it had ivy all over it. Excuse me. And my mom would get two big, I think they were yellow, pots of mums on either side. And I remember my mom telling me that the way that you keep mums really fresh and like growing really well is that you put a can of beer in each mum, one can of beer in each mum a week. And so she would buy cheap beer and she would put it in these mums. So I said that year after year after year. And you know, so this year I like got online and I was trying to read it because I was like, I'll just have Alex go and buy like, you know, a six pack of cheap beer. And, you know, because I won't buy it. So then I'll have him, like, you know, he just put the can in once a week. And I got online and I started reading about it. And it didn't, there really wasn't anything that said. It said that yeast can help plants. But it didn't say that it was, like, this wonder, like, you know, wonder trick that was going to make mums grow or, like, be, like, super beautiful. But it did say that it would make them stink. Because something about the plants and the and the yeast, the beer would make them stink or something like that. I think I might try it though and see what happens. At least just, I mean, it can't hurt for one week, right? So I may try it and see what happens. I don't know, what do you guys think? My mom swore by it. She had beautiful, beautiful moms. The other thing somebody told me to do about the mums is to go in and water them from the bottom. So like you stick the hose all the way down to where it's hitting the soil. And then you, they said this on my video the other day. Oh, look at this pumpkin patch over here. There's tons and tons and tons of pumpkins. How fun is that? Can you guys see? Right there on the corner. No, you can't really see it, but um, 
there's like four, these police cars were over here when I was like coming the other way. It's like one, two, three, four police officers on the side of the interstate. They've got like a pickup truck pulled over. Um, uh, but somebody said to water the mums from the bottom, which means you stick the hose right down into, um, like where the soil is and you water them from there so you don't damage like the flowers and the mums, which is smart and true, I'm sure. Um, I'm trying to think of other decorations that my mom put out every year for Halloween. I feel like there were a couple years we did like ghosties in the trees or something like that, you know, with like sheets. We, I mean, Back then we always did everything homemade. All my costumes were homemade. Um, in fact, like I don't ever remember like buying a costume in a store. Like I never did that. My, my dad is super, super creative and artistic. And so he would always, like when I was younger, like a young kid, he would always do my, um, costumes for me and I look back on some of my costumes and it's so funny to me like what I was like as you know like some of the costumes that I was like totally would not fly today like one year I was like a bartender or a waiter or something and I had like a bow tie like in a fancy restaurant and I had a bow tie on with like a tuck shirt and then I had like tux pants on and I had like on my arm my dad had like draped uh you know like a, t a dish towel kind of thing and then I had had, um, what do you call it? Um, I had a little fake mustache on and then over, I had a tray that I carried that had one martini glass in it and my dad had like put like a fake olive in it, glued the olive inside and then glued the martini glass. It was like a plastic martini glass, uh, glued the martini glass to the, the, what do you call it? The tray. And then there was like, I just carried the tray and that was my costume. Like, that would not fly today, you know? In 2021, I think about that sometimes, how that was like. Um, and then, one year, I went as a patient. I did a lot of, like, medical theme stuff, because my dad had a lot of those costumes. You know, I went as a patient, a couple years, doctor. Scarecrow, one year, my dad made this outrageous scarecrow costume with overalls, and it had, like hay coming out of it. It was fantastic. You know, painting my face gold, the whole nine th nine yards. Um, that was a really cool costume that I did one year. Um, but yeah, I went one year. It's like my friends and I, when we were a little bit older, they, it was like this, I think I was like in ninth grade or something. Two of my friends came over and they were like, no, I would have been like, cause I didn't have that close friend sent. It would have been like 10th grade. They're like, come over, let's go trick or treat. I'm like, we are way too old. And my mom was like, just go with them. It was these two girlfriends of mine. And so we like, they had robes on. And so we threw our hair up in towels and we had robes on and we were like, we went to spas and people loved it. And we went trick or treating that way. <laughs> I used to be obsessed with The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I loved, loved, loved the cartoon version, the Disney cartoon version of it. I still do. And um, I think it's on Disney Plus, which if it is, I will be watching it this year. I know that uh, Mr. Toad and Ichabod, Ichabod is on there because I saw that on there the other day. Um, but I was obsessed with that. And when I was younger, we would go to Connor Prairie and you could like walk around the town and the town, like they had like all this, like, so Connor Prairie is like a settlement and then you could go and they would have all this Halloween stuff and they had the Apple store open from Park Shooter. So Park Shooter is this private school here that has their own campus. And when my mom was growing up, it was two separate schools. It was Park and Tudor. One was boys and one was girls. And they have an apple orchard on their campus. And so, like, my mom and I, some Sundays after church, we would go to the apple orchard. And you can pick your own apples. And they had, you know, applesauce and apples, mostly apple cider and, like, apples. And so, we would get, like, a bag of apples and then, like, a jug of apple cider. And, um, or, like, apple butter. I loved apple butter. But later they had it at Connor Prairie, the settlement. I drove by, I drive by it almost every night when I vlog. And, um, so you can go out there and you can take a haunted hayride through the town and through the woods. And it's really scary. <laughs> it is kind of my level of scariness though, because you get, you're on this hayride and you're out in the woods. So you can see the kind of like the 
prairie settlement town in the distance, all candlelit, you know? And then all of a sudden, this headless horseman rides up beside you. I mean, it truly is a headless horseman because they make it, you know? This guy riding a horse looks like he has no head. It's really scary. And he'll go, woo, like that. And he has a flashlight, you know, and you can't see anything because he's got no head. So anyway, I used to love to do that. But then afterwards, you could get like yourself an apple cider donut or, you know, whatever kind of pastry you want, a cookie, and Roslyn Bakeries they used to use out there too. And then you get yourself an apple cider donut and some apple cider coffee or kettle corn or whatever you want. And then you can sit there and on this huge screen, they show the uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow with Ichabod Crane and, um, you know, Katrina, what was her name? Katrina, was that his girl that he liked? I love that movie so much. That is like a really Halloween movie to me. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, the Disney version, the cartoon. I love that so much. Yeah. The Neighborhood Kids and I, we used to every year, it was probably three or four years in a row that we did it. We, um, had a haunted house and we hosted it in my mom's garage every year because she was only like single mom and so she would just like move her car out into the driveway and then we would have the whole garage to do and my mom's friend from across the street I've shared this story on here before but my mom's friend from across the street was an interior decorator and so she could get like balloons and she could get anything that we wanted like for discounted rates right and so like she would just get these huge reams like reams of black and orange crepe paper right and so we would make these mazes all through it was so much fun like every day after school we would just tape and tape i mean the whole month of october we would just stand on um you know we would first we would design it okay so the woman across the street she had a son and a daughter and the son was probably four years older than me. The reason why we did it for three or four years and then it stopped was that the oldest kids kind of aged out, I think is what happened. So they were like three or, he was like, well, she was like two years older than me. So he must have been like four years older than me. So he designed it, the whole thing. And then there was like five of us kids that ran this thing, five or six of us kids. And, um, and he was part of it too. And so we would have, the, we put like, you know, um, we because there's windows in the garage, so we would put trash bags over the windows so you couldn't see in, and then um, you would come in through the back door. There was like a back door to the garage, like a door that you open to go out back, and then you would come in. And we had like all the crepe paper maze going through the whole thing, you know, areas where we were like scaring people and standing there and be like, ah, you know? And then at the very, I mean, it was very much like Roseanne's, okay? Like it was almost exactly like that. And then at the very end was the door that you opened to go into my mom or the mud room in her house. And then that, she would go in and into the kitchen. She had candy and cookies and cider and whatever. And then you could get your treats and you would go out the front door. And that was how people did the haunted house. And it was free. We offered it for free. And it was so much fun. Oh, my God. We did it. And that was back in the day when I feel like fall break was like a week. I feel like we had like a week of fall break or something. Or like Halloween would be like on a Saturday. And you would have like... Thursday and Friday, Wednesday, th Thursday and Friday off or something like that. I don't know. And so like that whole week we would come home after school and then we would have the whole two days and we would be out there literally like the entire day working on these garage. It was so fun. Oh my God. Back in the day. And my mom would make, and that was where she started making her chili dinners. And my mom would host these big Halloween chili dinners every year. Right. And I remember she would make tons of garlic bread and she would make mulled cider and, you know, she would have two kinds of cider. Cider with the alcohol in it and cider that was just no alcohol. And then um, she would, you know, like her friends would come over, my mom's like sorority sister friends and friends from the neighborhood and my Aunt Kathy, Uncle Dave and Caroline would come over. And um, I remember now my mom's friend that ended up saying that she was just uh, one of her divorced mother friends, that friend of hers that, <laughs> yes, do I sound bitter about that? I'm still a little bitter about that. But she was my mom's sorority sister and her friend that whole time. Her daughter that I was real close with, 
she and her mom would come over. So her mom and her would come over every year for Halloween. And I remember because we would always go trick or treating together. Like one year she was a bag of jelly beans. And I think that was the year that I was a patient. And she and I went. Um, and I have a picture of us still to this day of her. And, and she had a big clear uh, trash bag. And inside of it was all of these um, balloons. And she was a bag of jelly beans. But you know what I really remember? And so then my mom's friend from across the street, she would go to Roslyn Bakery and she would buy all the specialty cookies because they have like the regular Halloween cookies that were just like pumpkins, you know, with like the orange sugar shakes on it and stuff like that. And But then she would get the really special ones that were like witchy poos and they were like pumpkins but they had like the real icing on it you know like they were like the three dollar cookies but they were probably a dollar fifty back then or something like that but they were like the real deals and she would put them like on this like dang we each got to have one of them oh my god they were so good and then I, of course i loved my mom's chili because my mom made the best chili in the entire world she told me later, she's like, I don't know what is so special about my chili. She's like, I just use those chili -o packs and then I put spaghetti in it. My mom would take spaghetti, spaghetti, not like the macaroni, but spaghetti, but like, or macaroni pasta, but like the spaghetti, spaghetti, and then she would put it in the pasta. And so it was real thick. I loved it. Oh my God, so much. Uh, but anyway, you know what I remember is, so then when Halloween trick or treating, we would go trick or treating for hours. I can remember we just would go for hours. So of course we had to take, you know, different, like two of us would go at a time and we would come back and we would man the haunted house and two more, two more people would go and then they'd come back and man the haunted house and that kind of stuff. So that, you know, it was fair for everybody that was working the haunted house. But then after everybody had left and the Halloween night was over and everything like that, I can remember my mom and I, it would just be like the two of us in the house, but that garage would still, like we hadn't torn it down and you know, like, cause we would do that like the next day, all the kids would come over and we'd tear it down and clean it up. I can remember like years later looking up and it's like I would walk out there cause I parked my car in the garage, you know, like when I was in high school and stuff. And I can remember um, like going out to my car, like when I was in high school and looking up and there's still being like a, a little piece of like black gray paper, you know, like just like that big, like tape to the ceiling. And I always be like, oh. There's the haunted house, you know? But I can remember at the end of the night on Halloween, my mom and I, so she would be like, come on in. She was like, let's let's go um, go put your pajamas on and then you can go through your candy and stuff. You know, like how that's such a big deal to go through your candy when you're a kid. Look at McDonald's packed. It doesn't feel like a Saturday. It feels like a Sunday to me. So anyway, we, um, she go, go put your pajamas on. So I go put my pajamas on and my mom would go put some kind of movie or something in on, you know, like some scary-ish kind of movie, but not too scary for her probably on the porch. And we would be sitting out there on the porch and I can remember, cause we have this, we have this porch that was like carpeted. It was a room. It was a room. It wasn't like a sunroom or anything. It was a room room, but we called it the porch because every three walls were windows that you could crank out. Um, and then you stepped down from the dining room into it. It was really a cool room. But anyway, so we would sit out there and that's where we watched TV. So my mom was like, go put your pajamas, pajamas on and then come back down and you can go through your candy and stuff. And I can remember before I would go out to the porch because, you know, she'd get me hot cider and stuff like that so I could have hot cider. And then um, I would go out, I would go to the garage and I would open the garage and I can remember it would still be like pitch black and the crepe paper would kind of be blowing in the wind and I would be so scared thinking there was somebody out there in that garage trying to get me, you know, even though I had made the haunted house myself. And then I can remember I would like flip the lights on and flick them off real quick because I was so scared. And then I would double bolt the door. I'd like close the door and double bolt the door. And then we also had a door to the mud room that had a double bolt on it. So it was like I had the double bolted door to the garage and the double bolted door from the house to the door to the the mud room that I would double bowl so people could, definitely couldn't get in. <laughs> so crazy when I look back on that. I don't know why we had a double bolt on that. We had a lot of double bolts in our house. I don't know why. We had like one going down to the basement, but that made sense. I don't know why we had a double bolted door on that mud room. Anyway. That mudroom was a cool room. So when you came in, it was all linoleum flooring. And it was like this really cool linoleum flooring. And then there was like a boot rack, shoe rack, kind of a buffet table. And then there was a place like this, like coat racks. And so it was really like a room to like demud your shoes and take your shoes off and your winter coat and whatever. And I mean, we would use it like in the winter. Like we would leave like our boots and our coats and stuff in there and like, um, 
because, I mean, back when I was growing up, it, it seemed like we got so much snow and slush and stuff in Indiana. I mean, I honest to God, I feel like at least by like the second week of December, we were getting snow in Indianapolis. Maybe not like a, a, a foot of snow, but we were getting a lot of snow in Indianapolis by like the second week um, of December. And then that would go through literally like the first of March. Like, I mean, we, I, I just can remember like the majority of my younger years, my childhood years, you know, my youth, going to school and there being just tons of snow on the ground. Like, I mean, I walked to school every single day. I was a walker in elementary school. And for junior high, I took the bus. So I had to walk from my house, which we were on the cul-de-sac, so all the way down the street. And I can remember walking and it was, it's pitch black in Indiana, in Indianapolis, like at that early in the morning. And so I can remember walking. It was so cold walking down the street. The other thing that's interesting to me is, you know, like, I mean, that was kidnapping central like that those years and just to think that like i walked down the street i mean i walked like two miles to school in elementary school in the pitch black darkness of the morning i mean i'm like at the time like eight and nine years old right and i just think that's so weird that in retrospect like parents didn't think that that was like a big deal that we would walk to school by ourselves and I mean, it wasn't the only one. It was like everybody did it, you know? Um, I mean, and yeah, my mom took me to school sometimes when it was like super, super cold outside or I was running late or whatever. But like by and large, I walked to school. And I can remember before first grade, my dad, because my parents were separated by that point or divorced. So before first grade, my dad came over and like for a week or two or something, I can't remember how many times he did it. I don't, I don't think it was just once. I think it was more than that. We walked it to time it to see how long it would take because he wanted to know like what time I needed to leave the house by to get to school on time. And um, I've told this on here before, but I just think it shows what a great man my dad is. My dad, even though my parents were divorced and separated, called me every day in the morning because my mom was not quick to get up in the mornings. My dad called me every morning or in the morning my, the phone was in my mom's bedroom and I would like walk into the there to answer the phone. He called me every morning at six o'clock around that time to make sure that I was up and re getting ready for school. And he called me every night before I went to bed and just to tell me good night and ask me how my day was every single day. If, if my dad was on vacation in France or in the Caribbean, he called me. If my dad was at a work conference or was in a board meeting, he called me. My dad called me every single day. I don't think he ever missed, like not once. And, um, you know, was always involved in everything. So, but I just look back on that now. I think it's so weird, you know? And, and I do think, because we did talk a lot about, like, kids being kidnapped by back then. I mean, that was, like, the late 70s, early 80s. That's kind of, like, when there was a lot of that stuff going on. And I do remember having the conversations with my parents because... Um, my babysitter actually was kidnapped. She and her friend were kidnapped from McDonald's. And I had had several conversations, I think, with my dad before that on, like, things to look for if I ever got kidnapped, like, newspapers to see, like, what day it was or what the date was or what city I was in so that if I they let me talk to him on the phone, I could try to give, like, hints of things I saw. And, um... You know, my dad would say things to me like, you know, all the things that they tell you about with like kidnapping and whatever, you know, and, um, but yeah, my babysitter, I mean, she wasn't like a regular babysitter of mine, but her family was really good friends with our family. And she and a friend were at, Mc, I think it was McDonald's. I was just actually talking to my dad about this the other day. And he was like, no, 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 no. I was like, yeah, dad, that's exactly the story. He was like, no, it was, and I was like, are you sure? Cause that's not how I remember it. But anyway, she and her friend were at McDonald's and these guys in a van pulled up and they grabbed him and took him. Yeah, they hold, held him for like a week or two and demanded a ransom and they got a ransom and they released the girls and everything. And it was weird because my dad, <clears throat> he like figured out exactly where it was because he would drive the hospital that he worked at at the same time at that time was Community East. And he would like go over this 
uh, like train tracks and like the things the girls told them about later because they never did find the guys they never found out where they were that gave the ransom and the guys got away with it and um, my dad was like he he thought he knew exactly where the whole thing had happened because first of all my dad watched every episode of Perry Mason with my grandfather who was a homicide detective my dad used to say that he'd be like I can solve cases like really quickly because your grandpa he said your grandpa would watch Perry Mason do you guys ever watch that show with Raymond Burr who was in um, Rear Window he said your uh, grandpa would watch uh, five minutes of Perry Mason and he could tell you who had done it. I'm like, seriously? He's like, oh yeah. He was like, he we used to sit there. He'd sit in his recliner and I'd sit next to him and we'd watch Perry Mason together when I was in high school. And he said he knew right away who had done it. My grandfather was a homicide detective in Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, Allen County. And he served the, uh, he solved the first big homicide they had ever had there. And he was apparently on the front of I just found this out a couple years ago. Way past my interest starting in true crime, my aunt told me this, um, that he was on the cover of True Detective, I think, magazine, or True Crime. True Crime or True... I think it's True... Not True Crime. I think it's True Detective. She's got a copy of it. She keeps on saying she's going to send it to me, but I haven't seen it yet. So, so anyway, Aunt Janie, you need to send me that. She watches my vlog sometimes because every once in a while she'll say, I saw that you were telling stories about when you came to visit me and my farm in the summer. She lives on a farm. So, Aunt Janie, I need that uh, magazine of The True Detective with Grandpa on the cover of it because nobody's going to believe me. Has this been out of focus all this time? Come on now. Man, I've been telling all kinds of stories tonight, haven't I? <laughs> it's a story kind of night outside. Rainy and muggy. That used to be a whole strip mall in there and a the whole thing got taken out. And now it's a Valvoline. <laughs> I guess we needed a Valvoline more than we needed a strip mall. Who am I to know? This thing right here is an abandoned supermarket and it spooks me like crazy. Cause I'm like, do you think there are people living in there? Look at this. Can you see it? It's an abandoned supermarket. It's huge. There's nothing going on there. Nobody is like in this supermarket. But see, I think I just saw some lights on in there. Like that's what creeps me out. I'm like, are there people living in that Marsh grocery store? See, that's from watching too many of those abandoned move uh, videos on YouTube. I love those abandoned videos. I haven't watched any in a while, but there was a period where I, that I was going through where I was watching like, oh my God, abandoned water park videos. Those were the best. What is this restaurant here? They changed it. Texas and Margarita's Restaurant Bar and Grill. Do you know what I love? If anybody knows what chain restaurant to get this at, let me know. But you know when you go to like Tex-Mex restaurants, you know, and they have, the town where my ex is from, Seymour, Indiana, they used to have this restaurant. Why can't I remember what it's called? It might be called Tex-Mex. I don't think it is though. I can't remember. But anyway, they have like that corn succotash. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a side. Like when you go to a Mexican restaurant, you can get like beans or like rice, but then they have corn on the side and it's like, but it's not like it's like corn mush or corn grits. It's not like corn corn. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I don't know how to explain it. But I love that stuff. Like corn meal kind of. But like, anyway, I want some of that stuff. The place is called seven days dental. I wonder if that means that they're open seven days a week. I don't know. It's so weird to me anymore that so many of these stores that used to be open 24 hours like Walmart and stuff are not open anymore. Alex was coming home from, and I knew that the Starbucks closes early, but he was like, yeah, he was like, I was calling you because I was going to see if you wanted to get some, if you wanted me to get you some coffee. He was being real sweet on his way home from the, um, 
what do you call it, on the way home from the bridal shower or the baby shower today. But he said, but I went through that Starbucks and they're closed. And I said, yeah, they're closing at like 5 or 5.30 on Saturdays and Sundays now. Um, so a lot of places are closing early anymore. Early, as I said. A lot of places are closing early anymore. Speaking of coffee, we it stopped. Speaking of coffee, we went over to Sarah's tonight and... Um, so like when we were, cause Alex was so tired that when we were like in this texting group planning tonight, he said, Hey, can you make us a pot of coffee? Can you make us a pot of coffee? And she's like, yeah, I'll have, or he was like, can you make us some coffee? And she was like, yeah, I'll make you a pot of coffee or I'll have a pot of coffee ready for you guys when you get here. So when we got there, like I was so tired and I was like, Sarah, did you, did you make any coffee? And she was like, no, but I'll go in there. And she was so sweet. She like made coffee grind like ground the coffee and she made it like you know from scratch in the pot and everything like that it was really good co it was delicious coffee and I just sat there and you know I always make coffee in a Keurig anymore I haven't made it in like a pot in a while and I just forgot how much I just love a good pot of coffee I think like tomorrow I think I'm just gonna start making a pot of coffee in the morning and then like if I drink it I drink it if I don't I don't and then I'm just gonna have that coffee throughout the day because I forgot how much I love drinking like coffee like that. I just, I get the iced coffee from Starbucks. Well, this is water, but I get the iced coffee from Starbucks every day, you know? But unless I go to a meeting, and for a long time, because I would have that coffee during the day, if I went to a meeting at night, or if I went to like a noon meeting or something, I wouldn't get a cup of coffee. But almost all the time now when I go to a meeting, I get a cup of coffee because I love coffee. I love meeting coffee. I mean, it's nothing more than Folgers, but I just love meeting coffee. There's just something about sitting in a meeting, having a cup of coffee with your friends and everybody's having a cup of coffee in a, st a styrofoam cup. Do you want to hear how corny we are? Okay, so we pay like the church that like our home group has our meeting in and then we also buy our own coffee and cups and stuff like that and then we pay or we pay them for things that we use there as well because we rent space from the church so we came in this week and usually the styrofoam cups are real small like the, you know those little styrofoam cups we came in this week and they were like the big these big ones and we all about fell out we were like oh my god look at these we were so excited we have these big you know like when you go to a buffet and they have like the big tank coffee things that you make the coffee and the percolator things and then it has the tap on it so we have one that's regular and one for decaf for our meeting every week we make a huge thing of that every week we have for well ever since i've been coming to those meetings so 22 years they've been using those big coffee pot things which are really nice but there's just something about having a cup of coffee with your sober friends i don't know how to explain it I was telling Tanya I was reading this story recently and it was about this woman and she had just gotten out of, this was in some kind of like recovery magazine that I get and, uh, and Tanya gets the same magazine. And so I was like, did you read this story? And she was like, no, I haven't read that one yet. And so it was a story about this woman and she had gotten out of treatment and then she and her family were on vacation in I think Colorado or somewhere like that. And she felt really disconnected. And so she, and she wanted a cup of coffee like really bad. So she and her, she and her husband and her daughter like went to this other town. Uh, the story was all like anonymous, you know, of course. But anyway, she went to this town um, and so she was sitting there and she was like, the guy that like owned the diner was like, um, you know, what can I get you or whatever. And she like explained that she was like newly sober and he was like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm sober too or something like that. And he's like, if you ever need to talk, cause she was like explaining that they were staying like the next town over or whatever. And he was like, if you ever need to talk, um, the, the, it, the story referenced like a good cup of coffee or something like that. And so he said, if you ever need to talk and she was like, I really need to talk right now. She was like, like I'm really struggling right now. So her husband and daughter like walked around the town for like two hours and she sat like in front of this fireplace and this like snowy town and had like cup after cup of coffee with this like stranger that she had never met before. But the only thing they had in common was <clears throat> their recovery. And uh, I was like, I've had those moments before, you know, where 
I have felt so completely alone. And then I'll share with some complete stranger, you know? There's like language that we use, that we say, like, like if you want to find out if somebody else is sober, you know, you'll say, oh, are you, you know, whatever. Um, and I cannot tell you how many times, like I have been in a situation where I just was like, God, I just wish I had one person that got me. And somebody right there will be like, oh, well, I'm, you know, they'll say something or they'll say I'm sober too or whatever, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy, you know? And, um, I've had several moments like that. Even if it's just like somebody that works at a hotel and then like when I come, you know, down through the hotel to go to the pool during the day, I see them and I'm like, hey, how are you? Even if it's just something like that, you know, where I feel like there's that connection there or if I need to go and find a meeting like right then, you know, or whatever. But it's weird how the world works that way. There is something so powerful though about a cup of coffee. Like, I think it's like when you've like come from the depths of addiction, right? Especially like with drinking, because drinking's the opposite of that, I think. And your life is a mess. And like, there's a couple things that like I can remember that first day, like, you know in detox of like taking like a hot, hot shower and some of this will not sound appealing to people. I'm just going to tell you, but like when I look back on my experience, I can remember just taking like a hot, hot, hot shower, which I think I probably had been there. Like, I think that was probably at two days of being there when I finally like pulled it together enough to take a shower. But like, washing my, you know, hair and just like really scrubbing my body and I just felt dirty and gross, you know, inside and out and just taking like this really super hot scolding shower and then, you know, putting on crisp, clean hospital pajamas with a hospital robe, you know, oh my God, the battery's about to die. And, um, then going and sitting in this room with this little itty bitty TV that has hardly any reception on it. And there's three of us sitting in there and it's like snowing like crazy outside and having, and on the detox unit was the only place you could have caffeinated coffee and having this cup of caffeinated coffee when you haven't cared about a cup of coffee in forever. Right. And you smoke a cigarette and you've like smoked so many cigarettes just to smoke a cigarette in the past that this cigarette tastes so different than every other cigarette that you've had. Right. You're sitting there drinking a real cup of coffee, having a cigarette, and you feel the cleanest you have felt in a really long time, that is a sobering feeling. Like, that is super, super sobering to feel that way. And I can remember being in treatment and feeling like that, and that was, like, the first moment that I felt really, really good. Like, I mean, I thought, God, I feel human again. And so I think that's why, to this day, I still equate, like, a cup of coffee or taking, like, a really hot shower and putting on, like, super clean clothes. Like, I still feel, to this day, like, those things equate to me making me feel human. Because for so long, I didn't feel like that, you know? Yeah, I took showers and I did my hair and I put on, you know, the co costume du jour to go out and I thought I looked hot and I was just kind of pulling it together, you know? But to take a shower and just feel clean for once and not really care like how you present, you know? It's like, it's kind of like, you know when you do your hair every single day and then the one day you like don't do your hair and you just wash it and condition it and come out and let it just like air dry like if you're on vacation? Like that's how it feels, you know? And it's just like, I can remember feeling so clean, just clean and alive and human. And that coffee was just like such like kind of a life source to me, you know? And it was so funny because I can remember the, the battery's gonna stop. So when it stops, I will, if I don't have a chance to change it before it does, I'll pick up wherever it stops. But my, okay, the battery died. So I had to change it. Um, but anyway, uh, it's funny because my old supervisor and I, we went to uh, Louisiana, Louisiana. And we were looking at these halfway houses down there. And there, there were these really cool halfway houses. And so, these, this was forever ago. God, this was, 
this was when I was with my first boyfriend, so um, this was probably, I don't know, I was around 30 at the time, maybe late 20s. What's so funny about this is I do remember this because I had to um, get a new pair of khakis and I remember I went to Abercrombie and I got a pair of khakis and I had gained weight and I was like 180 at the time, 180. Three, four, something. I think it was like 184. And I remember I had to buy an, a size of jean or size of khakis up. It was like 34s instead of 32s. And that was the first time that I had to buy, a, which I look back on that and I think, oh God. But anyway, I still have those khakis and I love those khakis so much. They're like drawstring khakis. But anyway, um, she and I went to New Orleans, and then we went to um, Thibodeau, Louisiana, and we went to like all the area around there. It was absolutely beautiful, and these people took us, like we flew in and we stayed in New Orleans, but they came and picked us up for like a day, and they showed us all these halfway houses and stuff, and um, so, because uh, she was researching like halfway houses, and so she had me come with her. And it was really a cool trip. And so we got to see all these halfway houses. We went to like this young men's halfway house, this young women's halfway house, and they were built in old, well the woman's was built in a house. It was like in a, this really cool house. And they had like this whole group thing set outside like in, um, in the back that was around this bonfire. And the boys was like in one of those L-shaped hotels. And um, the guy that ran it, I remember looked like a very, very tall kind of like Colonel Sanders or something like that. It was very serious. But anyway, I remember like we went to a coffee shop or somewhere with them and we were ordering coffee and my supervisor who wasn't sober, um, she was, it was like six of them. They like brought friends with them to like tell their stories to us and stuff about going through like the halfway house. It was like people that had gone through the halfway house and grown up and like gone through there. Um, it was like we were, I think, using them as like a referral source or something because one of the cool things about Louisiana is that if you establish residency, I think it's something like if you establish residency in Louisiana after being there a year or two, that you can go to the University of Louisiana um, or any of their state colleges. But I think like University of Louisiana, Baton Rouge or something like that, you can go and it's like you can get like a full right scholarship or a grant or something. I can't remember what it is, but like their residency status is different, but you have to be there for a year. So for people that are like young adults that are like wanting to go to college or have like started college, but are sober and can't afford it and they've like failed out of school, like to go to a halfway house in Louisiana, stay there for a year and get sober in a clean environment, a safe environment, and then stay and be able to go to college, but also go into like a step down which is like a step down, it's called like a three quarter house. So a three quarter house is where you have like a lot of freedom, um, but you're still in like a, a sober environment. And three quarter houses have proven to be like pretty successful for like younger people that want to go to college. So you go to, you go to treatment, okay? And then once you're in like a rehab unit, you usually stay in a rehab unit for like 30 days. This would be like ideal. And then after rehab, you would go into like a residential program for anywhere from three months to six months or a year. Um, a year's a really long time for a residential program, but like let's say three to nine months. And then you stay in a residential program. I mean, today nobody does this because it's, excuse me, so expensive, but back then, three to six months in a residential program. And then in a residential program, you step down into a halfway house and then you do aftercare or like an intensive outpatient program with that. And then you stay in, some people, some people stay in halfway houses for a year or two, but you can step down into what is called a three quarters house. Now, a lot of cities don't have three quarter houses. I know Hazel and Treatment Program has several three quarter houses, I believe, because they're like the hub of recovery in the United States. Um, like, so if you ever have a question about treatment or recovery, just call Hazelden in Minneapolis and they can answer any of your questions probably and refer you somewhere. Um, but a three quarter house is like, you can like maybe have passes on the weekend regularly and you can have a, like a job. A lot of halfway houses today that you have jobs, you have to have a job to have a, but there's a lot of halfway houses that you don't. These that we were looking at, you couldn't have a job. Like you were just living there and going to meetings and stuff like that. But anyway, I remember we were at this coffee house or some restaurant, I think we were at a restaurant and they had brought these like two people with us, like a guy and a girl to tell their stories of how they had lived in this halfway house and gone into college and stuff. 
And so there was like five or six of us and our supervisor, my supervisor was there and she, um, and she wasn't sober, but like, so she didn't like know like how sober people really are hardcore about their coffee, but she was a coffee drinker. And so when they came, when they, the woman came to like order or take, the waitress came to, we were going to all get dessert or something. I think everybody was getting like a piece of pie or they took us somewhere where like the pie was fantastic or something. But then they asked the waitress, they said, now you have community coffee, right? And we didn't know what that was. And they're like, and she was like, well, of course, that's the only thing we would serve here. And it was like, apparently a place where a lot of sober people went. And, um, she said, uh, and my supervisor was like, what's community coffee? And they like all looked like she had said something horrible, you know? And they're like, community coffee is like the only thing that sober people will drink in Louisiana. And it's like this supposedly like great kind of coffee. And do you know what is so funny about this? Is that I talked about this about six months ago in one of my vlogs. And somebody from Louisiana sent me a box of community coffee curing cups. And I still have them in my drawer. I have three things in my drawer. Okay, I have tons of Keurig, Keurig cups up in my cabinet. That's where I keep my green tea and I keep my all this kind of stuff. In my um, in my drawer of the boxes that I use most regularly, I have three boxes. Okay, I have chamomile tea for when I'm going to sleep. Um, I sometimes use sleepy time tea, but I like the chamomile tea better. I have chamomile tea for when I'm going to sleep. I have um, uh, toasted graham Starbucks. And I have community coffee in there. Because I've still been kind of like every once in a while I'll have one of those coffees when I'm feeling like real sober. Like in the mood to like, you know, listen to a lead as I drive around or something like that. But I always think of that. It made me feel so connected to those people when they were talking about that community coffee. You know, I just thought that was such a cool thing. So anyway, yeah. Us sober people love our coffee to this day. We love, 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 love our coffee. Good cup of coffee. Anyway. Well, y'all, I don't have, y'all, now that I'm talking about Louisiana, I don't have much more to share tonight. It's a good day. It was a good day and tomorrow's gonna be a good day, hopefully praying on it. Sunday is my favorite day of the week to get uh, rejuvenated and renewed and restarted for the week ahead and refreshed. So, And I hope that you are too. And uh, I'm going to get off here. So if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. I hope that you guys are having a magically amazing Sunday. Do something to relax and refresh yourself for the week ahead. And um, I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. And if no, I love you. And I love you. Wait. Bye. <laughs> I can't do it now. Bye. Love ya. Oh, and if, if you want to hear it, for those that want to hear it, for those that need to hear it, and for those that are just going to stick around, you know how it goes. You know the drill. You know the song. You know how it is. One more I love you. I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Love ya. 